Welcome to the What If It's Not Depression podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Atina Stein. Today, we are going to be talking about motivation. And, you know, we know that when people are depressed, they can have a lot of trouble getting that motivation up to be able to do things. Well, motivation is also an issue with attention deficit uh, hyperactivity disorder or att attention deficit disorder. And we often see these things, not just in kids, which is really, really common, but also in adults. Um, today, we're going to be talking and un unpacking that um, whole concept and uh, learning from uh, Amanda Rubio, who is a licensed um, clinical social worker. Uh, we'll get more into that, but I just want to say first uh, that if you like this episode, please click the like button and subscribe to see other episodes uh, that I've done over the last few years. Welcome, Amanda. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here today and talking about ADHD, my favorite topic. <laughs> yeah. So let me tell everybody about you. Amanda is a PTSD and trauma licensed psychotherapist, yoga teacher, and holistic health practitioner. She helps clients safely explore mental, physical, and emotional aspects of themselves to improve their quality of life using cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, emotional freedom technique and somatic healing practices. She specializes in treating ADHD with tools and strategies like accountability, time management organization, social skills training, and mindfulness meditation. Believe it or not, there aren't too many people that do that. Uh, she <laughs> has been teaching yoga, meditation, and coaching clients into a healthier way of being for the past 20 plus years. She received her MSW from New York University in 1995. And in 2000, trained as a holistic health coach at the Institute for Integrative Nutrition. In 2009, she founded Yogi's Feed the Hungry, yay, a nonprofit organization that raises funds for the Rhode Island Community Food Bank. So Amanda is locally found in Rhode Island, and uh, she's uh, she's uh, so, I'm so happy to have her on my podcast. I've done yoga with her. Welcome, Amanda. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, so let's let's start from the beginning. I always like to hear people's stories about how they got involved and in, in doing the thing that they really love and uh, are passionate about. Where did it start for you? Uh, well, in, in, in NYU, I started uh, my clinical training as a social worker and um also, the interest to feed the hungry began there. I hadn't really encountered homelessness uh, growing up in Barrington, Rhode mm -hmm. Island. Mm -hmm. So I um, began that journey of just being of service, helping people. And uh, I also started my yoga teacher training around that time, too, in mm -hmm. New York. Um, and then when I moved to Rhode Island, I opened a yoga studio and I hung up my shingle too as a social worker and saw clients um, through the holistic counseling. Um, I didn't really have a private practice, but just kind of through the yoga studio as mm -hmm. um, teaching the yoga classes and the meditation and the holistic work. Mm -hmm. um, and then I got pregnant <laughs> and uh, closed the doors to the studio, decided I just wanted to stay home and raise my kids and breastfeed and just like be a stay at home mom. Luckily, my husband at the time was able to provide for us and allow me to do that. So I did that for many years. And once my children um, got into high school, were a little bit more independent, older, I went back to uh, social work. Um, I joined a group practice um, right around uh, 2020. COVID time, mm -hmm. um, so called telehealth, and just stayed with them for about a year and a half, got my feet uh, on the ground, and then I just opened up my private practice, and I was specializing in PTSD, but then I was attracting a lot of ADHD clients, and at that later point, my daughter was diagnosed with ADHD while she was in college, so immediately I just wanted to know everything about it just <laughs> so I could understand and help her, and I was just really fascinated by the brain, right. you know, how it works when you are neurodivergent. Um, right. That, that's been my work for the last three or four years. 
Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, why don't you let people know about what neuro neurodivergent means, uh, just for the people who don't may not know what that word means. Can you define that? Well, it's in the brain, there's um, a <laughs> lack of dopamine that's mm -hmm. getting up through the receptors. So it inhibits executive function. Mm -hmm. so oftentimes it's called an executive dysfunction. Um, and there's various uh, executive functions, but mostly it's, you know, working memory is one of them. So we often forget a lot of things when mm -hmm. you have a neurodivergent um, brain. You uh, Time management is an issue. Metacognition is a, a dysfunction there. Mm -hmm. um, planning ahead, organizing, structuring mm -hmm. your day. Basic tasks are are really a struggle for most people. Right, right. Um, and and uh, that can show up as attention uh, or ADHD, ADD symptoms or diagnosis. Yes, absolutely. So that's one of my first goes to's is I do an executive function questionnaire mm -hmm. to determine people's weaknesses and strengths. And I like to focus on the strengths, obviously, and then uh, provide tools and strategies to work with the weaknesses. Oh, that's excellent. That's really excellent. Yeah. So, you know, speaking of, of tools and strategies, can you go in into that more? And you, it sounds like you also use tools and strategies to ignite their motivation, you know, from within, as opposed to cracking that whip and do more, do more, do more. Right. And, uh, you know, a lot of times when people have these issues, they start feeling bad about themselves and feeling guilty or shame when they're not keeping up for whatever reason. And sometimes it's just being able to, you know, look at what kind of brain that they have, right? And then creating, looking at their strengths and helping them to understand uh, how they can operate differently to meet their goals, right? Yes. So a lot of self-awareness, right? Once you get the diagnosis of the ADHD, there's oftentimes like, oh, relief. Mm -hmm. you know, that's what's been happening. I'm not lazy. I'm not stupid. Right. I'm not bad because there's so much shame around it. So the self-awareness, oh, this is how my brain works. And then we'll do a lot of psychoeducation around it. Like this, the neuro, <laughs> the dopamine and all the receptors. And so medication is often the go-to mm -hmm. strategy. Right. <laughs> it has its side effects. And right. Long term, sometimes it's just not as effective. So I come in with holistic strategies, and mm -hmm. we work mostly on foundations, right? Your diet, mm -hmm. your sleep, exercise, screen time, mm -hmm. and your environment. Right, right. We get those things straight and up to par. Especially sleep routine, morning routine, structure, and the challenge is the staying consistent. Mm -hmm. Right. You get derailed. You go on vacation. Something happens. How do I get back? Right. To the routine, into the consistency. Right. And the ADHD brain is wired for these four motivators. Mm -hmm. Urgency. Right. So a lot of times it's like, oh, if there's a deadline, I can get it done. Right. So I'll do it. I'll stay up all night. I have hyper focus because there's that sense of urgency. Novelty is another one that helps motivate, right? This is new, this is exciting, this is interesting. Uh, interest is the third one. Like if it's interesting, I'm gonna be focused. I'm gonna get it done. I'm gonna complete that task. And then the interesting one, the last one is competition, mm. right? Right. That's why challenges are are very motivating, like five day challenges, right? <laughs> right, Yeah. to keep you on accountable and on track. So I'll work with competition within yourself, right? Like, mm -hmm. let's see if you can, you know, do this for 24 hours or try this plan just for today or see how it works because we want to build a sense of success to diminish any of that shame that's just always there. Right, right. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's really, really great. I think people need to recognize that there's different ways of learning too, right? There's not one way of learning. Some people can't learn just by um, reading books or 
<clears throat> or just by listening. Sometimes it's video, sometimes it's repetition, sometimes it's writing it out, you know, so it's finding your strategy of learning. That's really important. And, yeah. you know, understanding that that's just as equal as anybody else's strategy. No, there's not one better way. And it's really, uh, you know, it took me years myself, years to learn that I learn better audio and visually, you know, I wish I knew that before medical school, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but, you know, it would have been a lot easier if I just, recorded every session, um, instead of having, um, there was, you know, courses that were just pure book that was, you know, a struggle. It was just all we had to do was read them and then take a test. And that was really, really tough. So tough challenging. audio, yeah. yeah. In those days, we didn't have everything on audio books <laughs> 30 years, 30 some plus years ago. Right. <laughs> so yeah. But nowadays everything is on audio books. So, and people might find that like, wow, I learned so much by listening as opposed to reading the very same thing so yeah well and oftentimes people with the diet with the adhd diagnosis feel that they're starting a, a lower place than the average person mm -hmm. it's harder for me to keep my routine it's harder for me to learn something new and it, we get creative right you can you don't need to sit still in a quiet room Mm -hmm. Oftentimes we need multiple stimulations, right? Like have the radio on or some music on, and then, you know, you're watching this and maybe you're typing this other thing out, which maybe to a non-neurodivergent person, they'd be like, that's crazy. Mm -hmm. right. How could I do this? But because there's the hyperactivity, which isn't just hyper, it's um, overthinking, right? overcomplicating going down a rabbit hole, and then I'm, I lose focus, right? So if the mind and auditory or visually can have a couple of things going on, I'm able to focus more on the task at hand. Right. right. That's why sometimes people who uh, doodle, like in meetings, yes. <laughs> um, or, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. or they're on the phone while they're walking, you know, the, the walking is very stimulatory, and it helps to focus on the phone call as opposed to sitting. So I think if people understand that they will they'll be more respectful of people who need to do that as opposed to saying, Oh, they're not paying attention. No, it's like, I'm paying attention. <laughs> yeah. I'm paying attention. They have the widgets, the things that they hold, you know, to stay focused in, if, in a meeting or if they have to sit in a class. And the, it's so interesting. You bring up the walk and talk. I off, often offer that mm -hmm. instead of a, a video call because they can walk and, and focus a little bit more, especially if it's some trauma or some difficulty that's coming up for them. It's mm -hmm. easier to, to have that bilateral stimulation when you're walking. That's what the EMDR is, right? It's like that thing. Right. So you're walking and you're able to, to be present, but also pull up some painful stuff. Right. And if exactly. they're not exercising, which is con contributing to depression. Right we get out there and we, you have an hour with me. So let's do a little fresh air, limit the screen time and get that bilateral stimulation going. Absolutely. Yeah. The person who discovered EMDR discovered it by walking. <laughs> right? Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. 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 She, I'm forgetting her name. It's I think it's Francine. Um, I'm blanking on her last name, but I believe, um, yeah, she's the, uh, the person who, and she, she discovered it by, uh, I hope I'm right about this, uh, by walking and noticed that as she processed emotions, that her eyes went from one side to the other. And, and then she tested that out, you know, you know, over time, you know, to be something that was really powerful. So <laughs> it's the, it's the, it, the benefits and the results are amazing for PTSD with that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So when you're crossing that midline with your eyes, it is kind of bilateral stimulation of the brain, right? Yeah. <laughs> they'll, do the, they'll do the tapping like exactly. that. If they don't have the light. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And so that's why exercise is so, is so beneficial, right? Mm -hmm. Walking, swimming, biking, running. Mm-hmm. Yeah, not and it's not just beneficial for that. It's just it's also, you know, lymph drainage depends on you moving your muscles, you know. So 
when we talk about um, moving your body, we talk, you know, especially with people who are very fatigued and lack of motivation, it's just, just move your body for 10 minutes, you know, just to get the lymph going and, and getting those toxins out of your muscle tissue and, and, you know, draining into your, your gut um, and liver. So yeah, yeah, yeah the insulin. All connected. It's all- the insulin. Yeah, yeah. And it's so much of ADHD also is so it's the executive dysfunction. Mm-hmm. And then there's the emotional dysregulation. Mm-hmm. Right? You're just dis- dysregulated and you're hyper and unfo- unfocused. So the exercise, the yoga, meditation, that calms your nervous system. That- mm-hmm. The vagus nerve just goes right back into, you know, homeostasis. Right. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. So it's all, it's all connected and, and all of those, um, strategies together will reduce those kinds of symptoms. So, um, any other tools or strategies that you want to mention? Well, the diet is really important because if you think of working memory as one of the executive dysfunctions, right? Mm -hmm. Oftentimes I hear, I forget to eat Mm -hmm. and then I'm too hungry and I'm eating something fast and convenient, but Mm -hmm. not so healthy. And then I'm dysregulated, maybe too much sugar, too much salt. So the diet is really important. Mm -hmm. Having, you know, breakfast, lunch, dinner, or snack or having meals ready, prepared. Right. Because you're not going to be thinking about a metacognition, right? That's planning. So planning a meal, you got to go to the grocery store, you got to have the stuff, you have a recipe. Those are a lot of tasks. Mm -hmm. Which are hard to do, especially if you have ADD, right? It's really, really hard to do. So you have some ideas uh, or strategies about how to address that when you're faced with so many tasks I mean, when I, when I, um, provide a plan, um, you know, that's, everybody gets overwhelmed. And if you have ADD, they're more likely to get overwhelmed. So how do you address that? How do you sit down with someone who gets a plan of all the tasks that they need to do in order to get well? With the diet specifically, you mean, or just in general? In general. Yeah. In general. Well, we assess where they're at, Mm -hmm. right? different people are in different stages um, and getting a good picture of what needs to change. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes it is also the environment is very messy. Mm -hmm. (laughs) People, because it's video and they'll be like, show me their room. I'm like, oh my God, how? Yeah. You know, clothes all over the place. And it, that will be some of our session, you know, like, okay, well, what needs to happen? I need to go to the container store and get some bins I'm going to sort the things that I'm going to donate, the things that I'm going to keep. And I, once everything's in a, in a, in its place and mm-hmm. it's sorted and it, then your environment is free of that chaos that's already in your mind. Right. But it, mm-hmm. it, it's a little bit of that. So you can focus better. You can complete the tasks. You can be more productive. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think it's important to do it one, one, having one goal at a time. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Why do, can you brick talk about brick. that? Yes. The brick by brick. So with the overwhelm and the overthinking and the overcomplicating all the time. So we try to break it down brick by brick, mm-hmm. one small goal, one small task, even mm-hmm. if it's like cleaning the kitchen, right. I'll say, just start the dishwasher when it's half loaded. Mm-hmm because then it's less to empty, right? Mm-hmm. That's that's a simple example of breaking down a bigger task to a smaller task. And then we take it, so if I work with a lot of entrepreneurs and business owners and you know professionals, so the overwhelm, so we prioritize, okay, well, what's happening this week? What's happening today? When can you do that? When and where? We do a lot of strategizing. Put it on the calendar, right? Mm-hmm. So you won't forget. You set an, a time when and when and where. And then the other one I love to use, and my patients love it too, is do it now. Mm-hmm. You're going to forget, do it now. So that you get that text, just respond right away. Like some people are like, you're an anxious texter. You just respond right away. No, so I'm going to forget. Right. <laughs> to that email or have a standard email. 
that you can just copy and paste and send it because you're going to go into, I hear that all the time. I can't complete the note or I can't send the thing because it's not perfect or I, I didn't, you know, I didn't word it correctly. So do it ahead of time. Anything you can do ahead of time, setting your clothes out the night before mm -hmm. so you wake up and you're like, Oh, I don't have to think about that. I don't have to process that. Right. Right. Breakfast yeah. already made, you know, just got to heat it up or so simplifying, simplifying, we break it down and we do a lot of cognitive behavioral therapy, right? Because there's so much shame. There's so much negative self-talk. Right. Right. We work on the negative self-talk. I can do it. It might take me a little longer. I might need to go through a couple extra steps. I've done it before. It's not right. going to take that much time. That's another procrastinator that mm -hmm. comes in. That's going to take forever. I can't do that. Right. So and we challenge and it's, it's also really hard to get started. It's like, oh my God, initiating start. a task. Initiating yeah. a task is so, so hard. But once they initiate, it's like, it's easy. Like, why did it take me so long to just get started? So Five it's minutes. just, yeah. So I, I find that just even doing it for five minutes, you know, like, okay, I'll just do it for five minutes and set an alarm. That alarm will go off in five minutes and I will then have the choice to stop. <laughs> but usually most people keep going, right? And they finish the task. Yes, the task initiation and the task completion. There's so many tasks that are 80% complete. Right. right. And that what you're speaking of is the Pomodoro technique, right? You do 25 minutes of a task and then 25 minutes of a break. Mm -hmm. Get a little reward in there. Right. <laughs> right. And oftentimes you might be like, oh, I, I'm, I'm going. I don't want to stop. Right. I'm into it. Right. Yeah. Sometimes when people get going, they don't want to stop. And then they go into doing the task until 2 a.m. And that creates more right. problems. Right. Right. <laughs> right. Focusing and not being able to stop. Because right. we need rest, right? We to be productive, we need rest. To be re rest, we need to have pr been productive over something. There's actually a new book I want to read called Rest. <laughs> <laughs> about the layering of productivity and rest. Right. Right. Yes. People don't rest enough or take give themselves permission to rest and uh, feel like they have to always go, 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 feel pressured to do that. And if they stop, they feel a lot of shame and guilt. It's so common. And there's, you know, your body needs to recover. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, it really needs to recover. And that requires rest It's and sleeping, especially at critical hours, like getting to bed by 10 a.m., no later than 10 a.m., I mean, sorry, 10 p.m., no later than 10 p.m. So um, it's really, really important to get to, you know, to, uh, honor and make sacred your sleep time, but also resting in the middle of the day. It doesn't have to be sleep, but taking breaks, right? Mm -hmm. Taking, Take you know, going, what they call it green time, right? Go outside instead of this, shut the phone, stop scrolling, go outside, get some fresh air. Right, right. Yeah. So speaking of scrolling, I did want to ask you more about that. Can you talk more about that? Because that's a, it's an epidemic of a problem. And I don't, I know people hear about it. And it's like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's like, yeah, it's an epidemic. Yeah. It's bad. But, but what do you, what do you recommend, um, what people should do about it? <laughs> like, how do they put it down? Not yes, I should put it down, but how, how does one put down and stop the scrolling? Well, you think about it as doom scrolling, right? Like it's not going to elevate your mood. It's not going to get you to where you want to be. Mm -hmm. It's probably wasting time. So setting some parameters around it, whether you're, you have a do not disturb, like I, on my phone, it's at, at 9 PM, it, all things get shut down and they don't come back on until seven. Mm -hmm. I can cheat. It'll say, okay, it'll give me a 15 minute window to go back in, all but right. at least it's timed. Right. So right. maybe setting some, some parameters throughout the day as well. It's just, it's fun to not disturb. Not even going to go for a walk. Don't bring your phone, you know, right. go into the store. Don't bring your phone, go to the bathroom. Don't bring your phone. Right. 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 Just getting exactly. into the habit of not doing that. And I love the piece about sleep too. You know, it's your mind needs rest. Your eyes need rest. So not looking at this, we're on the screens so much and with the routine, especially with ADHD, that's our biggest goal is to get to bed on time, right? Mm -hmm. Just right. to set a timer and be like, oh, it's my bedtime. 
I'm going to put myself to bed because it's so easy just to stay up till two o'clock in the morning. And then I'll just take my Adderall in the morning and I'll be fine. Right. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I use uh, Siri a lot, actually, you know, Siri set an alarm for 10 minutes series, you know? Yes. uh, I love that. Yeah. uh, I have my, I'm hoping Siri is not doing that as I'm saying, (laughs) (laughs) but I put my phone on do not disturb for this interview, but yeah, I use it so much. Um, Put this on the calendar schedule, schedule, you know, 15 minute break or, you know, things like that. And the alarms are going off throughout the day. So (laughs) back to what the, what you said earlier about learning differences, right? So some people need to write it down. Mm -hmm. thing that pops up on your google calendar it's there and then it's gone Mm -hmm. right so i i'm like get a notebook use an index card get post-its write it down right right tasks for the day right your list we do whiteboards a lot Mm -hmm. see before you leave the house you have your whiteboard there okay do i have my keys do i have the wallet do i have the things because the time blindness you know often people are late Right. With ADHD. Absolutely. Yes. Late quite a bit. So, yeah. And I, I always suggest that if you have trouble sleeping at night, because you're thinking about all the things you have to do the next day, have a, a notebook at your bedside, write it all down, just do a brain dump right onto the, the notebook. And that way, when you wake up, you can organize the morning, uh, you know, do some you know, breath work and set some intentions and, and then look at your list and it's like, okay, I can do this. And you don't want to get overwhelmed by the list, but just organize and strategize uh, in the morning. So I find that really helpful for people too. Yeah. Cause we're, we're wanting to, you know, increase the focus and diminish the overwhelm. Right. Absolutely. You can't focus if you haven't eaten well, or you haven't slept well, or your room is a mess or you're, you know, right. Yeah. It's my patients are always like, that's so simple. I'm like, I know. Yeah, it, it <laughs> is it's, it's difficult, simple, but difficult to do. It's, it's easy to understand. It's, these are simple concepts, but it's putting them into action that makes it hard. Why do you think so? Well, because there's the with ADHD, it's not a matter of what I need to do or understanding it. It's when, Mm -hmm. and it's not how do I do that. I know how to do that. It's where, where, where does it need to happen? Mm -hmm. Where, where, when, and how much time? Time. Yeah. How much time does this really need? So I, I, I agree. I think you used a term time. Was it, was it time blindness? Time blindness. Exactly. (laughs) Because it's now or not now. Right. If it's not in front of me, that's why the urgency is a motivator, right? If it's not now, it's, it doesn't exist. Yeah. And, And that's why the notes are, if I don't see it, it's not real it's not happening mm-hmm. if I, don't, I was talking to a patient yesterday how about closets right you, you she's like I just hang everything up in one room so I can see it because I know I'm not going to fold it mm-hmm. well, and then I need to see it right mm-hmm. if I don't see that red sweater I don't doesn't exist I'm going right. to go buy three more right right so that's a tool and a strategy just have a have your things hung up where you can see them. Don't put them in a drawer. Don't put them in a closet. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So it's clear, you know, that it really requires getting to know that person in front of you and Mm -hmm. being able to think out of the box and find strategies that's going to work for them in their lifestyle. Right. And, and be right for them. And, uh, and, and, and then try those things and see how well it works because sometimes you try things like, okay, that didn't work, but it's then figuring out, well, why didn't it work? What was about it? It worked up to a point, let's say, and it's like, well, what was about it that it stopped working for me? And so when you have that back and forth conversation, then you can sort of figure out another way to handle it. Yeah. Right. Well, that's interesting. You say that because oftentimes I'll start with, when was there a time in your life where you were very productive? 
where you were motivated, where you were feeling productive and, and, you know, striving. And they're like, often there's like, yeah, when I was in college or when I had that job or what, okay, what was your life like? What was your day to day like? Mm-hmm. like? Well, I used to get up at five and I was so like, okay, can we implement? Let's, let's repeat that. We know right. that worked. Right. Right. I'm working with someone right now with some special accommodations at her place of employment. Mm-hmm because of her time, you know, she's more focused after 6 p.m. Mm-hmm. Everybody's going home. She's like, maybe I can do so. But I, I, I zone out from two to four. Mm-hmm. My brain just goes <laughs> still working on some, you know, and that's where that self-awareness comes in, that self-compassion, that's like understanding myself and being able to have advocate for yourself. Right, right. So when I think about what you just said about that patient, she might have some HPA action, HP, HPA axis dysfunction that might need some support with some, maybe some ashwagandha around that time period or around mm-hmm. lunchtime. Um, but yeah. what also just came to mind is that, you know, just to mention, so just in case people in this age group are listening is that perimenopause and menopause can lead to ADD symptoms. So they think, oh, I've got this new diagnosis, but it's because your hormones are now off. You right. know, you you need estrogen for the brain, you know, estradiol and progesterone and that have that nice balance. And so something to think about ladies, if you're going through perimenopause, menopause, and, and what we're talking about is partially describing you or describing you a lot right now. So look to get some bioidentical hormones, uh, on, on board along with, of course, reducing inflammation in other ways, which is what we do in our practice. Um, well, you hear brain fog, brain fog, yes, a lot. Brain right? fog. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So brain fog is caused by so many different things, gut dysbiosis and increased gut permeability and just old. Stress. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So do you want to add that you think we haven't talked about that's really important to mention? Well, I think one of the things, especially because at the beginning, we wanted to tie in a little bit of depression. Mm -hmm. Right. right? So 80% of people that have that ADHD diagnosis also have a second disorder Mm -hmm. or third, Mm -hmm. which is predominantly depression or anxiety. Mm hmm. And as you know, as a psychiatrist, right, those are mood disorders. They're right. not a brain dis- disorder. Right. So you've diagnosed both. Mm-hmm. And that's where I, I'm, I'm unique because as a, as a clinician, I can diagnose and treat and they're separate, mm-hmm. right? They intermingle because of course I'm going to be depressed if I feel ashamed or I'm la- you know, feel lazy or I'm not completing things or not fulfilling the potential that I know I have, mm-hmm. or I might be anxious because, oh my gosh, I'm always late or I'm never not turning these things. And my boss is, you know, my review didn't go well. Or mm-hmm. So we need to treat both separately. Right. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. And see how they're interrelated and how they play on each other and can, you know, what, what comes first, yeah, what's primary, what's secondary. Yeah. yeah. And, and on top of that, there's a high connection between uh, ADD and, and substance use, because you're Absolutely. trying to use substances to improve your ability, your energy, your, your ability to focus. And so um, sometimes people turn to, you know, other substances to try to sort of biohack their brain, right? So, well, and uh, nicotine, they're actually they're trying to develop a, draw, a drug that um, has the same impact that nicotine does on ADHD on the brain, but doesn't have addictive factors to it. Mm-hmm. Finding that if the, once they remove those addictive factors, it doesn't work. Oh, so wow. They're <laughs> like looking to see if, the, but you'll see a lot of people vape or they'll smoke or, Right. Marijuana is a big one too, right? I, well, my brain's like, oh, I just want to relax. Right. So we work on unlimiting that. Right, right. We're looking Understanding, at- yeah, I yeah. see it helpful, but it's maybe negatively impacting other areas. Right, right. Yeah, it's finding the benefits for looking at the benefits and the risks and how that's impacting you as a whole. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Amanda, it's been great chatting with you about all of these things. Let people know how to find you. Where are you located? So um, on Psychology Today, Mm -hmm. 
If you want to look at my bio there and you can reach me through their website or email me at rubio5727 at gmail.com or you can DM me on Instagram, ADHD Holistic Coach. Mm -hmm. Great. And my website is going to launch in a couple months. We're we're working on it now, but it's amandarubio.com. Awesome. Awesome. So I don't know when this is coming out, but maybe... By oh. September, <laughs> it'll be well before that. So, okay. so at least people know what the website uh, uh, URL is. That's awesome. That's yeah. great. Yeah. And we'll have everything in the show notes too. Oh, thank you so much. I had yeah. such a good time talking to you. Yeah, it was awesome. Great. Yeah. So thank you again. And, uh, and uh, I'm sure I'll see you on the yoga mats. <laughs> see you soon. All right. Thank you. Have a great day. Mm-hmm.